Oh, and it's in a, oh, hello everyone. <laughs> hello, welcome. Hi. Hi. Welcome everybody. We'll Hi. just give you a few seconds for people to join in. Glad to see you all here. All right, welcome to this live women in tech panel with three amazing women who I will introduce in a minute. My name is MK, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the Senior Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer here at Career Foundry. Uh, we have a big group joining us today. So uh, while people are joining, you can use the chat on the right-hand side to drop your name, where you're joining from, why you're interested in a career change into tech, and we're hoping this will also act as a networking opportunity for you. So feel free to include your LinkedIn if you want to connect with more women in tech. Find your community wherever you are. And before we kick off, let me just briefly introduce you to Career Foundry, if you're not already familiar with us. Career Foundry is the online school for your career change into tech, providing personalized programs in UX design, UI design, data analytics, digital marketing, product management, and full stack web development. The Career Foundry Career Change programs will take you all the way from complete beginner to job-ready tech professional, and you'll have one-to-one -one access to both a mentor and a tutor who are both experts working in your field. Our programs are also 100% online and flexible, which means you don't need to quit your job to do them. You can do them whenever you, you need to, and they are backed up by our job guarantee, which means that if you don't land a job in your, in your new field within six months of graduating, then you get your tuition refunded. That's enough about us for now. Um, let's introduce our lovely and very lively panelists. Uh, it's a fun group of women today. We were laughing a lot right before this live. <laughs> um, so today we have, you can wave when I call your name. We've got Elizabeth Amaya, who is a project coordinator based in Miami, Florida. We have Maria Nilo, who is a software engineer based in Guadalajara, Mexico. And we have Maureen Thorne, who is a digital marketing strategist based in Toronto, Canada. We're all over the world. Also, fun fact that you might be interested in, Maureen was, uh, was uh, one of our course writers for the digital marketing program. So I've actually worked with Maureen before. Yeah, um, yeah. nice yeah. to work with you again. <laughs> exactly, and if you sign up for a digital marketing program, you'll read her work. Um, anyway, I'm sure you all brought your burning questions for our panelists. So just a reminder to our audience that we will be having a live Q&A at the end. So you can drop your questions in the chat and we will take them at the very end of the panel. All right, let us go ahead and get started. Panelists, are you ready? I'm ready Let's to go. go. Let's, Let's go. go. Let's go. Okay. So one of the main questions that we get from people who are considering a career change into tech is where do I start? So why don't we go around and each of you can share what your path into tech was, whether you've changed careers or whatever your background was before tech, what motivated you to pursue your career in tech. Um, let's start with Elizabeth. All right, let's do it. So the first question is how I, I got into tech. Yep. All right, so I was in banking for six years. I worked in San Francisco and I worked my way up from like working in the branches, private banking, corporate banking. I had that whole career ladder trajectory. One day I just realized I, I definitely plateaued and I didn't feel like I could grow anymore. And so I wanted to find a new career path. I wanted something more fulfilling. I was, um, my role in the past was heavy in sales and operations. And so I was looking for something that was less um, um, like combative and just something more collaborative. And I went to Google, went down a rabbit hole and I found UX design. I found Career Foundry, took the course. I graduated um, in June, 2022, so last year. And then just through a bit of networking, I want to say, but just keeping an eye on Career Foundry Slack channel, I saw um, like a job posting for a company called TechFleet, who I am a, where I am a project coordinator now. And I applied for a couple roles. I didn't get anything, no interview, no acknowledgement, zero, nothing. But I joined their Slack channel. And one day the CXO posted a message looking for project leads. And I thought to myself, well, I have nothing to lose. No one ever got back to me. I am definitely nervous. I'm reaching out to the CXL directly, but why not? Like, no one's gonna say you're a bad person. No one's gonna judge me. It's mm -hmm. me myself and I, it's me against me. So I reached out to him and I said, hey, I saw your message looking for leads. 
but I reached out to him too late. I definitely had like analysis paralysis. I was thinking too much. It took me two days to get back to him and the role was filled, but we kept our conversation going. Like fast forwarding, he and I had like an informational interview. We got to talking about my experience and he gave me some good advice on something I was dealing with at that time. And then it was an article and I read the article, let him know my thoughts. And then a couple weeks later, he just handed me the role for a project lead on a project that was um, just brought to his attention. And so that's what I was doing for, I don't know, like six months or so. And then the, the projects ended, but I stayed on as a project coordinator and that's how I ended up in tech. That's awesome. That's so awesome, Elizabeth. And yeah, it takes a while sometimes. You're gonna be in the job search for a couple months sometimes. But that's such a good idea that you reached out just for an inter informational interview, just to find out more, and then you're you're on their radar at that point. Yeah, it takes a lot of you know getting over your fear, and kind of working through your fear. Like I said, it's you against you, nobody else. That's yes. right. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, Maria, how about you? What was your path into tech? Uh, I was from I think really early age, I already knew that I wanted to be involved in tech because I'm absolutely uh, obsessed with video games. So since I was like four years old, there's that story where I didn't like go to, I, I didn't want to go to Christmas dinner because I wanted to continue to play Mario, Mario Morel. So there's a lot of stories of me uh, getting too obsessed with video games. So I knew that I wanted to kind of like work in something similar that allows me to 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 play video games uh, my train of thought like was like okay they're coming from japan so i need to uh learn japanese and go to japan and find a a, a you know a land a, a technology job but um that kind of like started to change i started to grow and my interest started to expand more and i got really interested in testing things in qa Actually, I, I, I found out like it's really fun when someone, somebody does something and you are not judging, but you're testing it. And then you can start seeing like the, like the, like the holes. So you actually deliver something that is like very, very uh, solid, right? So I, I kind of started doing my, while I was studying, I was studying uh, web development uh, here in, in Mexico. I kind of like starting also creating my own company it didn't went well. Uh, I, I didn't have that entrepreneur uh, seed still in me, but that got me a really of ex uh, a, a real experience in QA. So I landed my job in in another in my first company here in Mexico, and and I started to to understand how uh, technology companies work, and I started to fall in love only the, like the 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 things that they do and the creativity and and it's just a, another it's just a craft but it's just technology but it's a craft so i i saw myself like that i i saw myself like a like a creative person that is crafting something but it's just like as a software engineer so that's basically how i end up i i knew from very early stages in my life that i will be and end up in something related to this video games were the link I, I like how you described tech as a craft. It's sort of, it can be like an, an art form. People don't really think of it that way, but absolutely it is a craft. Um, and I also really liked the, um, the the fact that for Elizabeth, it was something that you did after you already had started a career in banking. And for Maria, you knew since you were little. So yes. it, you can come into tech from any sort of background. You can either know right away or it can take you a while to figure out that maybe that is what you want. So it's cool to hear both your stories side by side. Yeah. Um, Maureen, I'm curious to hear from you what your path was. So um, I'm going to take us in the Wayback Machine because <laughs> mine, um, I would say that probably the first inkling of it started, you know, in high school. I really excelled at math and I really enjoyed math. Um, and I had negotiated my way into this accelerated math program at my school where all the brainiac math kids were. Um, however, I kind of felt like I was pushed out uh, by the teachers and the other students because I really didn't fit the mold. <laughs> um, I was a cheerleader in high school. So, so I don't know if that was something to do with it. But 
really, I think that was really unfortunate because having that experience really affected my early career direction. So I ended up choosing to go into something, to Mariel's point, like more creative and just focusing on creative and not math and science and technology. Um, so what I did was a post-secondary education in marketing. Um, but within my early career in marketing, I would always gravitate towards math and data and analytics of any job that I was in. So I just couldn't shake it. <laughs> right. Um, and so I continued, continued that early career in direct mail marketing, which is very focused on data and data segmentation. But I knew that, you know, direct mail was a <laughs> little questionable for the future. And so um, digital marketing was going to be the future. So what I did was I secured a lateral move with my existing employer to jump into the e-commerce section. And I took HTML classes. I took other digital marketing and technology courses at night, classes at a local college and online. And once I got my feet wet kind of in digital marketing, I did find it was a challenge to cross over completely because it was now a question of maintaining a salary level, right? Because you'd already worked, you know, if you've already worked. Um, and uh, so, but I decided that it was worth the risk because I kind of knew that digital marketing was the future and direct mail was sliding. So um, I figured out how to manage that financially with, you know, what I would hoped to be only an initial salary reduction. Um, and that was in fact exactly the case. Within a year, I was able to secure a role that allowed me to work um, fewer hours, more flexibility to balance my family needs because I think MK, you know, my kids are professional, were professional actors. So I needed some flexibility as well to be able to manage that and take them to jobs and stuff like that. So, um, so I was able to get a role. I had fewer hours, had the more flexibility that I needed, and I was making more money within a year. So it was definitely the right choice for me. Um, it was kind of a lateral move within marketing, but still um, a change, a big change for me. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Maureen. I didn't know your kids were actors. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, I, I also, and I now noticed that for each of you, it's actually been a slightly different path. Like Elizabeth, you, you did it a little later. Maria, you did it from the beginning. And Maureen, you did sort of a lateral shift. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and I, I appreciate what you shared about how in school often we're pushed away from STEM courses uh, or STEM path because people don't see us as the as a type of you know typical person that would go into it, which is very yeah. unfortunate. And hopefully and that's changing. I, I th that like I say a little bit in the way back machine here because this was quite a while ago. But I mean, and I know that things are definitely changing. Um, but you know, there's always. I think that panels like this show that, you know, you know, women should be in, you know, <laughs> women have every right to be in tech and uh, love yeah. math and love science and still, you know, have blue hair or whatever. Right. So <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Don't put me in a box. <laughs> <laughs> Can't put us in a box for sure. Um, all right. Well, let's do a, a next question. Um, now we get to the juicy details. Uh, something that we hear a lot from women is the struggle with imposter syndrome. Um, and especially if you're new to something or if wh whenever you start a project at work, even if you're an expert in your field, you might still get a new project that you feel is very challenging or you might feel like you're uh, doubting yourself or doubting your abilities. Uh, so yeah, imposter syndrome, if you're not familiar with the term, is when you doubt yourself or you feel like a fraud. Um, and we all encounter this feeling at some point in our lives. It's not specific to women, of course, but I would love to hear some advice from each of you um, on what, how you tackle the feeling of, of being an imposter or when, when you start feeling like, oh, I don't know if I belong here or I don't know if I'm, I'm, I know enough. Um, but do you have any tips for our audience? Let's start with Mariel. Let's start with you this time. Yeah, um, have a few, uh, a few tips. Uh, the first one, is if you actually feel in a place where you still are getting to know yourself because that's the first like step to overcome the sin the imposter syndrome just look up to someone that you really are a fan to for example for me it's michelle obama right so i will look into michelle obama and i just will see how she makes speeches and how she reacts and we'll like google her and study her and 
see her in panels like this when they, they are questions, there are hard questions that she has to answer. And it kind of gives, gives me like, like a baseline of how I would like to behave because I'm a fan of her. That means that she has things that I would like to have or that I already have and haven't found. So that's the first thing. For me, it's been Chelo Gama, and it could be any different because I, I actually... He actually started with Obama and then I kind of like changed it to Michelle Obama because that's kind of like I, I started to just be very, uh, uh, very aware of what she was doing and how she was talking. And we go low when we go low, when they go low, we go high, like these kind of things like really speak to me. And the other thing that I will say is like getting to know yourself, knowing your boundaries and be kind to yourself also and talk to you as you would talk to a friend and knowing you as you get to know a person that you really love and really like makes you kind of aware of your own boundaries. So, and, and it's, uh, it's never, and I'm going to say this, it's never like a hike where you just overcome the imposter syndrome. There are many variations of situations where you will feel it again and that's pro that's that's progress. Uh, it's just that you have to remind yourself things. Uh, just like a, a couple weeks ago, I was feeling really like very uncertain uncertainty in something that I was doing, and I just felt how I just saw myself in another person, and all of a sudden, I, I like this dangerous person get out of me with a confidence that I didn't know where it come from. I became another person, I became Mariel Obama. And I was like, I was like, no, 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 we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to treat you as a stakeholder, no, as a, as a business owner, because we are blah, 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 you know? And it took me for me to see that they were doing something to someone to actually like understand my boundaries, see, re see the reflection of my situation in another person to overcome my, imposter syndrome so it's never it's never a hike it will be very there will be like very it, it will be good moments bad moments but just know yourself know your boundaries and if you're still if you're still there just look at a person that you look after and it's easy that's your baseline that's great advice. I really liked that. Um, also loved to Michelle Obama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when they go low, we go high. Why? <laughs> and I, I also feel that um, it's such a good practice, no matter where you are in your career, to, to, to practice talking to yourself in the mirror as your own best friend. Yes. Uh, hype yourself up. You know, if you have a big presentation or a panel coming up or, you, you know, you've got a big project you got to prepare for. Just look at yourself and give yourself advice as you would your own best friend. That, that's such a good point, Maria. Thank you. Um, and you're right. Like, success is not a straight line. So if you fail, it's just part of the process. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Let's go with um, Maria. Oh, Maria, you just answered. Sorry. Maureen. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I know a lot of people. So when it comes to imposter syndrome, a lot of people will say, fake it till you make it. Okay. But I've never really been a fan of that idea because I feel like it's, it's very inauthentic to me, right? It's being somebody who you aren't, right? So the last 20 years of my career have really kind of shown me that so many people out there are faking it, right? You know, while I'm worried that I'm the imposter in the room, I realize that it's actually like others who are like so confident they're actually all flash and no substance. Um, and it it kind of started to make me angry. <laughs> I mean, it would make me mad, actually. It would make me angry because I was like, why are people listening to these experts, right? They should be listening to people who know what they're talking about. Like me, I would think. And then I was like, that was my epiphany. I'm like, see, you know, so you're the one who knows what you're talking about. So clearly you're not the imposter. It's the people who are faking it till they make it with the imposters. <laughs> and they're coming out as like total confidence, right? And people are following them and they're saying sometimes crap, right? So, <laughs> um, so to tackle imposter syndrome, I just remind myself of all of those times that that happened. And that, and it gives me the confidence and like the fire because it made me mad to be the expert that I know I am. 
So that's that. That's probably what I would say for imposter syndrome. I love that. Just let it fire you up <laughs> to imagine all these people faking it. And you're like, but I do know. I know. I know what I'm talking about. Love that. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, and Elizabeth, how about you? Some of the best advice I ever got was get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's taken me many places in my career for many years. Be a person of action. And it's not easy to be a person of action. I can't tell you how many times I've had to be on camera in front of many people, giving direction, leading teams. And I was so scared, so scared. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. I don't know if this will be successful. I have all this planning, I have all these notes, but now the responsibility is on my shoulders to get this done. Will it work? And get used to that feeling of maybe you're nervous, maybe you have fear. It's not bad. If you're nervous, it's because you care. If you're afraid, what does that mean? False evidence appearing real. It's very important for you to give yourself the same grace and patience to yourself as you would give other people. Turn that over to you. I think Maria and Maureen gave very, very good points. But Maria was saying she looks up to Michelle Obama. But what's the important thing there? If you have to get something done and you're not sure of how to do it, think of the person who you most admire and ask yourself what steps would they take do those steps for yourself. Though Ma Maureen is saying, you know, we can get advice from anyone on the planet and it is good. But at the end of the day, we know ourselves the best. We know what we need the most and we should honor that. So to sum up all of this, think about what Mariel said, think about what Maureen said. What I'm saying, yes, get comfortable being uncomfortable but take that action and practice. I promise you the, more you, the more you practice, the more you get those reps in, that feeling of fear, discomfort, et cetera, it, it lessens. All you gotta do is take that first step. Wow, Elizabeth, so inspirational. I'm, I am inspired, thank you. <laughs> I love this calm energy you have as well. I feel like you could have a podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't but be afraid to fail. I've had my share of failure and I'm still in it. Yeah. So. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And and you're so right. The first step is going to be the hardest. But the, the more practice that you have being uncomfortable, doing things that are out of your, your uh, comfort zone, that's how you're going to grow. That's how you get there. Yeah, and I, I love, uh, I think people are writing in the chat, if you're nervous, it's because you care, that resonated with them, absolutely, yes. it's because you want to do well, and I think actually a lot of the times when we have imposter syndrome, it means that um, we're doing things more carefully, it's actually a good thing, Yes, we're, we're more aware of the process, we, we you know, double check ourselves, we, we ask questions, and I think that makes us stronger. Ask a lot of questions, that's what I've done, that's what I keep doing, mm -hmm. don't, if Many times in my career, I've thought maybe I shouldn't ask this question because they may think this, this, and that. No, my name is on it. It's a hundred percent on me. I'm gonna do what I gotta do to make sure I get everything right. Yes, done. Yes, right. that's right. If if you weren't ready, you wouldn't have the opportunity. All right. Well, let, this was amazing. Thank you. Um, let's go to the next question. And this time, let's talk specifically about the experience of being women in tech, because I think a lot of the advice that you share is relevant regardless of gender. But um, I, I do think being women in tech puts us in a specific category and people perceive us in, in, a, in a specific way. So let's uh, discuss that. I think it's, it's important to be realistic about the challenges that come with being underrepresented Absolutely. in tech. Yeah. Um, but I want to be mindful of not, not just focusing on a deficit lens, but also celebrating the strengths and, and the superpowers that we bring to tech, what we add to tech as women. So my next question comes for you in two parts. Part one is what challenges do you encounter as women in tech? And then part two, what superpowers do you bring as a woman in tech? They can be related to each other. Or they can be separate. It's up to you. Um, let's start with uh, Maureen. 
Okay, so when it comes to challenges, um, I would say that on occasion, and I referenced it earlier, you know, others might make assumptions about my understanding of math or technology. Um, and that could be because of my gender, it could be because of my rainbow hair, it could be, you know, so, um, <laughs> but, and so it kind of goes back to what I said about imposter syndrome, and really kind of owning the fact that, you know, I do have more expertise than I give myself credit for. And so I need to own it, own your expertise, like, you know, yourself, you know, that you're in the right place that you're where you're supposed to be. So you need to own it, and you need to show it. Um, and then uh, another area I have been in meetings and with clients or coworkers in tech and outside of tech too, um, at, and have been treated like an assistant, um, even though I'm leading the project. So, you know, I've been asked to get coffee. I've been called honey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've been explained something technical, even though I'm the one who's presenting the technical brief. So mm -hmm. I am really a big believer in stopping bad behavior in its tracks. <laughs> I, I stop it early and I stop it often and as yes. respectfully as possible. But, you know, and you'd be surprised how effective that is. Um, to just, uh, you know, you don't want to embarrass anybody, but you also do want to call, you know, call out the error. Um, and uh, to Marielle's point, you know, like, you know, be, um, you know, know your boundaries. Like, I mean, that, I'm, and if you, one thing that I always thought is if you take something once or twice, or three, it's, it's going to be a lot harder later. <laughs> so, I would rather lay down the line out of the gate. And so that's really, you know, the challenges that, you know, and you kind of have to do that in a way that is as respectful as possible, especially when you're dealing with maybe a client, right? Um, so, um, so that's the challenges when it comes to superpowers. I would say number one, um, being like having the balance, um, focusing on a balance between people's needs and company goals. So whether it's employees or clients or, be, you know, being in touch with your emotions and understanding, um, you know, people um, helps us achieve more. So I feel like that's one. Um, I know a lot of people talk about, you know, emotional intelligence and that may be different for everybody, you know. So um, another thing for me for specifically is kind of prioritization, um, you know, Household and parenting responsibilities still fall more on women than their male counterparts, despite holding down similarly demanding careers. So the last 20 years of doing this has really made me highly adept at project managing, you know, work and home life responsibilities and quickly establishing priorities and efficient plans for getting it all done because there's so much yes. to do. So, um, so that's really essential for a woman in tech. And the last thing that I would say about a superpower is um, the ability to kind of focus on the right things. Sometimes people in tech can get so deep in the weeds of like actual programming or integration. And um, it sometimes takes that bigger picture and how it all it connects with the technology that can be overlooked. So one of my superpowers, I would think I would, I would say is ensuring that, you know, the end goal is always the focus of any project. Not letting the tech overtake the, the purpose. Thank you, Maureen. That, that was a, a very powerful answer. And I, I appreciate that you spoke about how as women, we sometimes I'm going back to the challenges, but as how sometimes we in meetings get treated as you know sub differently than some of our peers um and uh there were some questions in the in the audience um chat about how do you respond to such comments in a respectful way <laughs> <laughs> um template that you use so I mean, you know, I I have like I said, I mean, like I, I saw some of your actions when I said that I have been called honey, <laughs> right? Or like you have not. I'm like, yeah, I have. Yeah. Um. So and I think it's a, a clearly a sign of the times, right? You know, things are 
much different than they were 10, 15 years ago. So, um, but how the template for kind of, you know, I have actually had a client call me honey um, in, in a meeting, in a initial meeting. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and I just corrected them and I said it's not honey it's Maureen and uh, you know like uh, you, I think the, the request was honey can you get us some coffee mm -hmm. and I said it's not honey it's Maureen and mm -hmm. you know I'm sure that you have someone here that does that I'm the project manager so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll be looking forward to that coffee <laughs> and and quite honestly, and I, I think I said I will. I, I don't need a coffee. I'll have a water. Thanks. And I, I, you know, and I know that might be come off as rude, or I, I don't know. I didn't think it was rude, mm -hmm. and I thought it was appropriate. And um, and I, you know, didn't lose the client, and he never called me honey again. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we then had a, a ongoing relationship for years where he knew that that was not what he was going to call me. It's so important to set that boundary early. early. Yeah, yeah. It, it might be, though, I think for some people it, it can be so shocking in the moment, whether it's, you know, being called honey or, you know, experiencing some other form of discrimination that you might just freeze up in the moment and not really know how to handle it. So you just sort of ignore it and hope that it didn't actually happen. I can't. Um, I just can't. Awesome. That's me, though. <laughs> right. I mean, I know you're a very extroverted person, so I, I know that it probably was easy for you to handle it in the moment. But for somebody who maybe struggles with, you know, um, confrontational conversations, you can definitely do it in writing or you can follow up with them one-on-one -on -one afterwards. There, there's many ways to do it in a respectful way, but to set that boundary I would say one thing, though, on that, and I understand that not everybody is as, you know, maybe outspoken as I am, but I will say that the, it's, I think, and I've seen it happen, I think it's easier to do it out of the gate, because if it's later, it becomes more, now you're trying to break a habit and you're trying to stop mm -hmm. something that's already happened. So, yeah. you know, you don't have to take quite the tone that I did, but you could, you know, you could be, <laughs> you know, you could be like, it's Maureen and I'm the project manager and that's it. Right. And just keep it simple. And that, you know, lays down, you know, your expectations of how you'll let people treat you. I think confronting that's a situation doesn't equal fighting doesn't equal uh, giving feedback, doesn't equal making someone feel bad. You can give feedback saying, uh, actually a, a, a power that the, the person has saying like, you could use this power to kind of balance this mm -hmm. and, and ask to be called in a way that, that you prefer to be called is a right, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's, right. It's, you are not asking something that is not proper for a conversation and it's unkind or it's confrontational in, a, in that way. You just will say like, no, I will prefer you to call me Marie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something that maybe we, we when we say like confront the situation, we, we, we say like, we are gonna fight, but sometimes it's just, no, just talk about right. it and it doesn't right. have to be a fight. It just have right. to be, it doesn't have to be a big deal. It can just be like, no, I prefer not to be called honey. Thank you, you know, you can say it nicely, um, but, say it yeah thank you thank you both um elizabeth uh what what about you some what is uh, challenges a face women and then superpowers yeah before i answer i just want to say that it's such an important skill to not be afraid of confrontation and it is not fighting it is setting boundaries i've struggled with that many times in my career because i guess like yes like as a woman especially like as a young woman in business you're around and with money you're around, around, you know, for lack of a better word, it is a it's a big ego. A lot like big clients coming around, especially when you go up the ladder, the bigger the clients get, the bigger the stakes are. And you run into certain challenges. I've, I have been very blessed in my career to be a part of very inclusive organizations and teams, but you have a few every once in a while, especially like, in my case where, you know, they won't think I'm smart enough. They're judging me based on my appearance, the way I speak, where I'm from. And it's, I'm nothing else but that. And so my brain power, my work, I always let that speak louder than me. 
I don't hide myself though. I have my earrings, I have my my eyeliner, my my mascara, my lips are lined, my hair is done, my my clothes are on point. I do not stop being me. But my work speaks much louder than anything else. At least from the world I come from, numbers are everything. It doesn't matter what you do, who you are, you have the numbers, you can back it up. No one can tell you anything and you will find support. And if you don't leave, that's what I did. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I know what I'm capable of. I know where my future is going. I believe I deserve better. I do deserve better. And so here I go. Not saying that I have not been blessed in my career. I've worked with incredible people, incredibly smart, intelligent people, and I've learned from them. And I tailored it into my own embodiment. Let your work speak louder. Always, 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 always. What was the second part of the question? I apologize. Um, I yeah, no, you answered the first part. Great, love that. And then uh, the second part is what superpowers you bring, which I feel yeah. like you're, showing, you're demonstrating through your work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, always have executive presence. I'm a very nervous person. I just got a lot of practice. Like if I have a presentation, I'll record myself on Zoom by myself and just watch, do the recording and just watch myself and give myself honest feedback. Make sure you have executive presence. It's not about being loud, but how you carry yourself. Put your shoulders back. You know, if you like, depends on where your camera is. I know it's hard like in a remote setting, but try to have it eye level. If, if it's not, it's not a big deal, but give yourself space. Don't, don't be afraid to take your time. I'm a fast talker. I've had to learn to slow it down, but take your time. There is no rush. Mm -hmm. People have to listen to you. And then also, you know, be a problem solver. A lot of times, you know, we want to help people, especially as women. That's very true for me. I always want to help somebody. And so I've had to figure out, okay, what is the best way for me to help them? I've learned I give them the right tools. Okay, what does that mean? In my line of work, I give them the right tools with certain products and services. But before I get there, I find out, okay, what challenges are you facing? What is your problem? What pain points do you have? What's working for you? What's not working for you? And you just start to have this conversation about that person you are helping, about that person you're trying to solve a problem for. And then when you understand, well, sometimes you might not understand. You're like, oh, this is your problem? Can you tell me more? Why, why do you feel that way? How did you get to that point? You know, be like a detective, be very curious. And then when you can pinpoint what their problem is, that's when you're like, oh, okay, you're feeling this way because of this reason. I have this product, I have this service that can help you get to X, Y, and Z or improve by 20% based on our current clients. So my superpower is problem solving through empathy. Walk a mile in their shoes, but you do that by really trying to understand what is your problem? Because I want to help. Again, very powerful answer. Thank you, Elizabeth. I think that's really excellent advice and it is definitely a strength that we bring as women. I think mm -hmm. women tend to be, not exclusively obviously, but I think women tend to be raised with, with empathy in mind more often than other genders are. And I think that's, for better or worse, I think it, it does actually help us in our careers mm -hmm. um, and can help us a lot. Sometimes it can stop us. Maybe we're like, feel, you know, too, too sorry or too bad to like say like, please don't call me honey. But I think a lot of the times it actually can be a strength. And, yeah. um, and, and if we use it in the right way and know how to direct it in order to problem solve, it's it absolutely, it's a superpower. Yeah. And don't apologize. Yeah. It's not honey, it's Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not honey. I'm sorry. It's Elizabeth. No, right. it's not honey. It's Elizabeth. Right. Mm -hmm. Eye contact. Mm -hmm. Executive presence. Absolutely. I, I feel like I gotta stand up straight up. Um, <laughs> and uh, but yeah. the power, I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotta do the power pose. Mm -hmm. Um Maria, I, I don't think you've answered yet, right? Uh but no. challenge, uh, challenge and then superpowers. So one of the challenges I can tell you, um I was a I was a project manager for a period of my career. Um 
And then uh, it happened, right? I became a manager. So one of the things that I noticed is when I had a project uh, and I have to go like, ask people to do stuff and give a status. Uh, I didn't felt that gender bias. I felt it once I was sitting down in a table with managers discussing the future of the company and the strategy of the company. And I felt how when they asked, for example, who is going to take the menu of this meeting, how they turn to, to see me. And they kind of sell it like, well, it's because, you know, yeah, like you are very disciplined and you're, but uh, I, at that point of my career, I read a book uh, of, I, I forgot the name, uh, but it's, uh, but it's basically, uh, it was basically telling you like, you, if you have a seat in the table, you have to use it because you are representing women statistically you are representing other women that don't have a seat still in that table so then i i that that was uh that was not my that was a manufacturing company so it was not kind of my thing uh because of balanced life and stuff like that so then i joined my new company and what i understood there is that we as a woman have to sponsor other women if you have a management position or you have a position that is uh, that has the privilege of having people reporting to you or the privilege of, of choosing a strategy, you have to sponsor, you have you also have the responsibility to sponsor other women. And a sponsor is different from actually like mentoring. A sponsor is to statistically look that you will have 10 men and one woman there. So you have to sponsor this woman to actually be the difference there to actually help her to make a difference where she is at. So I, the challenge that I found is that I sometimes didn't feel the sponsor enough by other uh, colleagues, either men or women. And the challenge that I found is, as Elizabeth said, you have to know, I have to prove that I knew in order to gain respect, which was something, was a privilege the others didn't have. And the other challenge that I had is to be her, to, to say like, uh, so when I said it is because I'm not taking, like I'm not managing my emotional intelligence, but when a man say it is because he's assertive. Well, we're saying the same thing. So what is the difference? So starting to call out these kind of things uh, and in the, in the room. And also I found out that my, the team of, of, of the people that I was sitting in never had actually like someone like me sitting sitting there. So they were learning a lot <laughs> with me, many things. Me understanding that I did I did deserve be sitting down there and making the strategic decisions for the company. And there they understanding that a woman along with them was equally making those decisions. So that's kind of like a... Uh, how I, I the, the challenge that I had uh, in my in my in the manufacturing company that I was talking about, uh, they were like, it was like a, if we are, if I talk about a percentage, it was like ninety five percent men, five percent women. It came to a point where we have like the toilet and, and the restroom, and they actually like change one of the restroom to male because there was there were so many that they we actually didn't need it. It was just like a visual representation of how how woman in tech is still a thing that is emerging at this point. And when we're talking about superpowers, which was the second, which was the second part of the questions, I think is just woman brings authenticity to to the room. You know, uh, I have uh, one client, and we were discussing things, and I remember that he said she has passion. And I remember that we, it was this conversation that when people started like, uh, just like, Maria, like, lower a little bit because you're kind of like, this is a client. But I remember that he said that she has passion, she cares. And I think that's authenticity because I do get to get uh, too motivated when I'm talking. I, I raise my voice, but it's not because I'm angry. It's because I'm passionate about what I'm talking about. 
you know, and that's authenticity. We don't care about how we are there. We care that, that we are there only, not how we got there. We care that are there. And, and that's a thing that I, I found that it's kind of not celebrated enough. But we bring authenticity. We bring our, and you can call it empathy. You can call it emotional intelligence. You can call it whatever you want, but it's authenticity at the end. That's such a good point. Yes, absolutely. I think also we're, we're more authentic because we care more, like you said, and like Elizabeth has said as well, because I think um, we, have, we have more at stake. You know, like we've, we've had to fight harder to get to that point, to be that, you know, 5%. <laughs> Um, we have to we have to be honest and say that we don't have a privilege. Mm. We are we are in a we are in a field where, where we have to fight for things that are given to others. Yeah, that's a reality. That's a statistically a reality. So we just have to be more prepared and show. And eventually we will be more. That's why we sponsor. We don't mentor. We sponsor. Yeah, and that's a superpower as well. Like it's a challenge to feel like we have to sort of represent all other women just because we're the one woman in the room. But at the same time, that is a superpower that we have is that we have the, the um, ability to be that representation that is much, much needed. And can I mention one more thing that's just kind of right in the same vein is that I also worked in um, for a client who was manufacturing based and technology based right combine like the combination of working with technology and manufacture which you know um and yes like so you know very 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 high percentage of men in that industry and i think that what it does and it's a little bit about what you said about representation but in the room but to me it also brings a little bit of um you also get to bring a different perspective than anybody else who's sitting around the table. So you're bringing a different perspective than, I mean, because everybody else kind of has a similar perspective because they all kind of came the same way and they came from the same privilege maybe or wherever. And you're coming at it from a different angle and looking at things differently. So I think that that's probably another um, superpower is that, you know, particularly in tech that you're bringing a different perspective that others are just, because I can't tell you how many times I've been in a room with, you know, eight men and I've said something and, you know, and they've been like, huh, never thought of it that way. Like never, we've <laughs> talked about this 10 other times. No, you know, so it's, it is super valuable and it is the superpower. Yes, absolutely. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I feel so inspired. <laughs> um, thank you all. All right, so I'm going to jump to our next question, which I think a lot of you have already touched on, so I think it's relevant. Um, but it's something that we get asked a lot in these panels, which is about the, the balance, how to balance having personal responsibilities at home while also trying to pursue and maintain a career in tech uh, and do your best in your career. Um, these, these could be all, all different types of personal responsibilities. It could be, for example, parenting, or it could be working another job at the same time that you're trying to uh, you study, or it could be managing your mental health, could be taking care of your family. We all have personal responsibilities. Um, and of course, these are not specific just to women, but I think as Maureen said, a lot of the times personal responsibilities at home tend to fall in an unbalanced way towards women. Um, mm -hmm. So you can speak to whichever one, which, whichever responsibility uh, you feel that resonates the most with your experience, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how to find that work-life balance. Um, Maureen, do you want to start us off on this one? Sorry, me, right? Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think um, probably the one thing that I would say is it took me a really long time to realize this, but self-care is critical that um it, you know it means that you're and we've talked a little bit about this before elizabeth has mentioned mm -hmm. it like giving yourself permission right like i mean because women tend to feel guilty and you know like you know they pulled in a million different directions and they feel like they should be you know everything to everybody and so what i would say is that you know it means giving yourself permission to focus on advancing your skills for your career or taking a step away from your career focus to take care of your family. And um, and I, I love what, again, what Elizabeth said, like, you know, don't be apologetic. Like, I mean, it is, you know, um, you know, 
you have, we are people, we are humans and we have priorities and sometimes they don't matter. In fact, MK, I had contacted you last week and I had said, just, I know I'm on deck for this panel. My dad is having surgery the day before. I'm a little concerned. I'm just letting you know so that just in case I totally blow out of here, you know, he's fine. Um, but you know, I, and that's okay. Like, I mean, it is okay for you to say to, you know, work and to your responsibilities at work that you have something at home that takes priority and it's okay for you to say to your family, y'all need to make dinner for yourself because I have stuff to do. Right. Um, and I have other priorities. So, so it can be, you know, taking care of your family priorities, your career focus. It can also mean just taking downtime for yourself. So if that's a spa day, if that's your thing, if that is, you know, if it means taking a month long vacation, then it means taking a month long vacation because that's what you need. And if it means that you're going to be, you know, on the couch tonight, watching Survivor, which I will be, with a big old ball of popcorn. And that is what makes, you know, is going to work for you to get give you that self-care, then that's what you do. So because at the end of the day, self-care is going to allow you to be happy and more fulfilled from all of the parts of your life. And it will make you a better parent and it will make you a better partner and it will make you a better woman in tech. So, I mean... It's easy. And I can't believe it took me forever to figure it out. But, you know, I know it's not, you know, earth shattering, but, you know, sometimes you need to just give yourself permission. I really, really appreciate that. We have to show up to work as full humans. And I think if, if the company that we're working for does not really understand that, then it's time to get out. As Elizabeth was saying, like, if it's not really giving you what you need, or if it's not really an environment that you want to be a part of, then get out of that. Um, and Maureen, like you said, I think, you know, when you wrote to me saying like, you know, have some patience just in case something happens with my dad, I thought that was so, so reasonable. I didn't judge that at all. And I think that's more of what we need. Actually, we need to be able to be vulnerable just at work and, and feel that we can have support at work as well. Um, so it's so important. And then also just taking time for yourself, telling your family to make dinner for themselves. I think um, <laughs> it's a small thing, but I think like, and for you to be clear, not just for themselves, yeah. but for you. <laughs> I mean, you know, don't take care of yourself. Yeah. Also take care of me because it's, yes. you know, like make and dinner think, for everybody you... and tell me when it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's something that your your kids probably appreciate and learn from as well and uh, admire. Like I remember my, when I was little, my mom worked as well. And I, I, you know, if she if she said like, I'm really busy tonight, it was actually kind of nice to have this role model of like, oh, this is, I have a working mm -hmm. mother. I'm going to work when I'm older, you know? So yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Maureen. Um, how about Mariel? So I see this balance, uh, uh, the balance time, uh, you know, I have ADHD when we were discussing this before the, the panel, ADHD and autism. So for me, kind of like time is like a magical thing that happens. And I can sometimes be in a work time where eight hours already happened and I didn't notice, you know? So uh, I am very disciplined in understanding my meetings and understanding what I have to be in, connected in, in certain hour. But I see my work life as a harmony. So that means that usually because of how my brain works, I will be very uh, productive by am. That will be like the best time for my brain to actually get uh, problems solved. So I usually wake up 5 a.m. and I start working and I need to stimulate my brain because I did see in audition. So I also I'm taking French and I take a goal line. So for me, it's like just a harmony of things that I the intention of me of like having something done and the knowledge that I have to be in some time at some place for a meeting or uh, an end of date. And the harmony of how I just like Lego pieces, I basically take a place for everything in the day. This could mean that uh, maybe I work the whole Monday and on Thursday, I am only doing meetings because I'm fulfilling my responsibilities. Uh, this could mean that I will wake up and I will play video games because that's still a thing in my life. 
I will play video games uh, or I will play video games uh, in the night instead of 5 a.m., you know? It depends. For me, I when I tried to do a routine that was really strict, saying like 5 p.m., I'm going to stop working and don't talk to me and I uh, whatsoever, I'm, I'm not Marielle in, in my company, I'm just gone. I realize that it causes me more stress than anything. So somebody, the, actually the CTO of my company gave us this advice along with another, uh, uh, with the CTO advice. The CTO tell, uh, talk, uh, talk about the harmony of your life, that harmony is different of routine and harmony is actually like you be content of what you did in your day and feel happy at the end of the day. And our CDO talk us about that there will be times where there are high load of work and that could happen. Just know that if you see the valley, the, the bell where you are going down, if you see the landscape that that is getting uh, along the, along the time, you just know that you will that that's not actually like your balance of life. That's actually just as a, a, as a pike of work that you have for a couple of weeks. So for me, it's harmony and just also understanding that there will be times where things will not will be as you want to. And it's OK, because if you see like, well, the valley is coming, I'm, I'm going to be I'm, I'm seeing it. It's just a week of hard work. It's OK. It happens. That's the industry that we are in. That's technology, you know. But for me, rather than balance, it's harmony. And it worked perfectly for me. I really appreciate that distinction. I think it's it's so true that there are times at work when you're busier than others. It's not always even, like the, the workload is not always spread out evenly. Yes. There might be times when you're like, there's a lot to do and I just got to get through it. But then other times where you can feel like it can go a bit slower. So I think it's I'm okay sorry. as well. I want to add something else because I mentioned Kardashians also. That's, <laughs> and, that's, and, and, I, and I'm going to second what Marie, Marie said. Having hobbies and having things that you like, like guilty pleasures that you enjoy, it's a way for your brain to debuff the whatever that, that it has. So for me, it's Kardashians, Beverly Hills housewife, like whatever you call it, I'm there. I'm there and, I, and I'm there season by season. But that's because also it's, it's a way for me to laugh. It's a way for me to self-care, yes. showing appreciation with my guilty pleasure, giving me the pleasure of seeing something that that, that is so away from my life, right? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I actually started to do that once I understood that I need hobbies so I don't get the whole day stuck at work. When yeah. you have other things to think about, you can balance your life. You can like just like unleash yourself of work because you have other things to think about. Yes. F feel free to uh, share your guilty pleasures in the chat if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do think it's important, like you said, having ADHD, you have to learn how to first of all, work when the, for the times that work best for your brain, because it might not be that nine to five is best for you. It could be that actually your brain works the best at night and having a company that is understanding of having flexible hours is really helpful. Yes. And I, actually, I find that more tech companies are doing that than other types of companies. So actually going into tech, if you have ADHD, can be really useful for you. Um, but I, I also think that having ADHD at work, you have to set boundaries in the same way that we've been talking about setting boundaries with others. You have to start setting boundaries with yourself. You know, and give yourself like from this to this time I'm gonna work. But if it doesn't work out or if my brain's not doing it, like I can I can, you know, work differently depending on the day. You just have to be kind to yourself. And I, I find that that's another theme that keeps coming up in this conversation is like be kind to yourself, be patient, treat yourself as you would treat a friend. Um, Elizabeth, oh sorry, I just made your screen bigger. Um, Elizabeth, let's hear from you. Um, how do you manage like okay. personal responsibilities with having your, your work? Yeah. So like I agree with Maureen and, and Mariel, you know, it's really important to take care of your mental health. I have anxiety. And for me, I'll think of one thing like seven times. And sometimes it's hard to get out of that, that thought process. So having techniques in place to take care of your mental health is so important. So like, for example, I'm also like Mario, I work best in the morning. I, I get up at 5 a.m. ish, 5, 5.30 in the morning. But to get rid of all this energy, I work out first thing in the morning. That 
energy that me exerting myself and working out and it's nothing crazy it's like 20 minutes it's pilates sometimes i'll use weights sometimes i won't but just that activity is enough to kind of exhaust my body a little bit where i'm at peace and of course exercise is proven to have so many health benefits there's you can't lose so to help manage my anxiety working out in the morning is first thing and then you take a shower like release all of the energy from the previous day or from the night you know you clean up after your workout and when you're out of the shower you feel rejuvenated and as i'm getting ready like i'm putting on meditation music putting on my makeup slowly and doing my hair but then i'll also like meditate for like 10 minutes and it varies the consistent thing i do is exercising and meditating but you know Give yourself time in the morning before you just jump right into work. The hobby, for sure. I love composing music. I studied music throughout my life. I compose my own meditation music, and that helps me de-stress. But when you're in life and when you're in work, you need to reward yourself. That's been very hard for me to do, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so for me, I'm like, I need something where I'm just not going to think. It makes me happy. I love science fiction. I love fantasy. There's an old show called Stargate SG-1. That is, and Maureen, you may know, because it's like it's a Canadian-American um, production. I love it. I watch one new episode a day, so I don't binge watch. I reward myself by having one new episode a day. There's like 10 seasons, so I'm set for a long time. I see a cute guy. I see the adventures they go on. It takes me out of my mind to this beautiful fantasy world this show has created, and I feel good. Find joy in whatever you're doing. Find joy. And to get a little concrete, prioritization is so important so like if you have something that's urgent and important get those done first if you have something that's important but maybe not as urgent put some time on your calendar to get it done if you have something that's urgent but not important try to delegate as best you can and finally if you have something that's not important and not urgent, get it off your to-do list. Bye. Give yourself this space. When you get things done in the beginning of the day and it's quick too, it tricks your mind thinking, oh, I have, I can do more because you're giving yourself this space to do it. So I hope that helps. So it's a combination, right? Self-care, hobby, rewarding yourself and prioritize. That, at least for me, but that can give you this work-life balance. I really appreciate that, Elizabeth. I think that's such a, an important thing to remember is to, to find joy in what you do, not just at work, but also in your personal life, because I think sometimes our work can become so heavy that we don't prioritize finding joy as well for us, just for us, yep. you know? Um, so prioritize joy as well as your work. Thank you all. Um, I'm gonna move on now to questions from our audience. So this is the exciting part where we get to answer all your questions. If you haven't asked a question yet, go ahead and pop it into the chat and we will try to get to as many of you as possible. So the first question, um, if, if you're not sure, oh, this is from Tracy. If you're not sure about which tech path to take, do you have any advice on how to help yourself narrow the scope? Each of you are in a different industry, so I think this will be interesting to, to hear from you. Whoever wants to answer can go first. I'm not going to call on you anymore. I have an answer because it was actually part of my last, that we had another question, but we're, I, we're out of time. So um, I think that um, if you, it's your it, like industry experience. So if you have... If you don't have tech experience, and this kind of, I think, might answer another question as well about beginning your career, but um, your industry knowledge can go a really long way. So if you, um, so if you like the career, if you like the industry that you're in, um, like Elizabeth in banking, maybe you know, and she enjoys it, but she kind of just 
got to a point where she was like, I'm not challenged, but you still kind of enjoy the industry, but you've taken in so much industry knowledge, then a great choice is to actually kind of stay within the industry, but just move towards tech of the industry, because what you gained over that five years in the industry or 10 years or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, if you have construction experience and you've been like literally a construction worker out, like building houses, having going into construction technology would be fabulous for you because you have the experience of the end user to be able to inform the tech. So that's my answer on that. That's, that's such a good point, actually. And, and this came up in our last panel, but somebody asked, like, what if you've taken a long break from work to have kids? And I feel like um, that, that's another great relevant experience that you could bring into tech. You could start, you know, making an app for mothers or something or for parents, just as another idea. So excellent point, Maureen. Um, any other comments from you, too? Uh, I, I, I will say that uh, right now we are living in a really different area um, era where I started in tech, where it was uh, not so easy getting materials and people to actually like teaching you in very different ways. So now you have, for example, these career foundry uh, programs that you can take. And uh, is first, I think you, as Maurice said, I follow that. You have to decide what you want to do and that's inform yourself. Uh, there's a lot of, of data already there, uh, videos uh, in YouTube that you can actually uh, do the research. The research never ends. That all these books are related of management and all these books upstairs are related to, to, to coding and management. And I'm taking like Golan classes. Like it never stops. You have to be very aware that if you're in technology, you never stop learning things so you have now internet to do the research of what you want to do and then you have to start uh finding this kind of like uh uh companies or, or, or academies or career friendly that they will go with you take you by the hand and once you decide what you want to do you just have to take a program and just take it from there now you have many outlets of people helping you to get it started in, in, in tech. It's more you deciding what you wanna do. Do you wanna go to digital marketing? Do you wanna go to design? Do you wanna go to coding, to software engineering like I am? Like you have to decide where you wanna be and then just like researching what are the, the, the companies that can help you or the programs that can help you and just take one of them. It's investment of your time, investment and in discipline. And if you like learning, this is the correct path because you never stop. Yes, absolutely. I think in tech, especially, it's uh, a lot of self research as well. Like you could take a program as well, but then while you're on the job, you're constantly having to research things as well. Yeah. And then Elizabeth, any additional points? I would say follow your curiosity. Like when you're stuck, that's the best, the best advice I can give. Be mindful that yes, like especially maybe for a lot of us here trying to transition industries completely. As Maureen said, you made a very important point. It will be easier to transition when you have when you're going to something that's very similar to your past background. Like for me, like if I'm leaving tech fleet, it'd probably be smart for me to go into fintech industry because I have the banking background, I have the knowledge, and just you know the the experience there but when i started career foundry i did the ux design program i did not end up in design i knew really early on well not that early but as i got into the specialization so as the program was ending i realized that i'm not the best in figma i'm not the best in adobe xd i'm not terrible <laughs> but i'm not the best one and i knew that but i knew what i was good at and I knew that I was, I was good at talking to people and problem solving. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, what's next after that? That's when I just started to follow my curiosity. I found the posting for Tech Fleet in Career Foundry Slack channel. I didn't get anything from it initially, but I just, I just stayed on that, that Slack channel and just try to engage myself with the community. 
like helping people with like wire um, usability testing and things like that. But when the CXO posted something about project management and leadership, I was like, why not? Mm -hmm. It's not a linear process. Follow your curiosity and take advantage and leverage your strengths and experience. Really, really great advice. Yeah, and I think this actually answers another question that we got from the audience, which is, um, how do you how do you break into tech without a specific background, like a like a computer science degree? Um, and I think you had, you had the great advice of like just reach out to people, ask for informational interviews, see, you know, see what 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 they have going on, like you did with Tech Fleet, and then eventually maybe you you'll be reached out to directly from them because they'll know who you are, you'll be on their radar already. I will say, if I may add quickly, yeah, yeah, please. Networking is probably the fastest way to yes. break in, and it's yes. not the easiest thing to do. It's very, you know, very nerve wracking. You know, when you're doing a networking call, like a coffee chat, an informational interview, nine times out of ten, that will turn that it can become like a first interview, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So you want to be prepared to tell them about yourself, tell them why you're interested in the company the job that came to mind. But when you approach a call like that, it's not about you, it's about them. You wanna Just, understand the person you're talking to. What's the culture like in the company? What was your career journey to get there? What are some of your favorite things that you do on the day to day? Make it about them because mm -hmm. they will start to ask you questions. And it's best to be prepared as though you were going into like that initial interview. But the more you start meeting people, the more chance you have to kind of break in. Mm -hmm. so, but it takes time. Yeah, I would also so just kind of building on that a little bit is like really, I mean, I 100% agree, building and leveraging your network, especially in LinkedIn or anywhere where you can kind of be niche um, and is really, really critical. Um, I find uh, really that women in tech are especially receptive to making connections, providing advice, opening up opportunities for other women. So, um, so I think it's a great, I mean, it's a great way to kind of, you know, build that. And if that means I, I literally, I think I've met, I have my own agency, right? And I will literally reach out to a few people in my network and say, hey, you know, um, you know, open to new clients, like I have a little bit of availability in my roster. And within, you know, the next week, I had three different meetings set up. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't with them. It was people that they said, you know who you should sit down with? Mm -hmm. X, Y, Z, and you guys should talk because there might be opportunity for you. And so there might be opportunity for you, maybe not now, and it doesn't matter whether you have opportunity right now, because you would be shocked at how many times sitting down with somebody today when you don't need anything from each other, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. turns into... I literally got, you know, um, a request for proposal, you know, a week later. And I'm like, yes. you know, so it's it's shocking, actually. Um, and then I would also say leveraging your, I mean, we talked about this a little bit about industry experience, but leveraging your soft skills and your transferable mm -hmm. skills. And this goes a little bit to what MK said about, you know, like when you're breaking into the industry, when you're new to tech, but leveraging those skills. And even if you've taken a career break, you have skills that you learned yes. as a parent at home, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they are ex more relevant than you could ever imagine. Just problem and soul beam. Problem and soul beam. <laughs> yeah. you Time management, problem management, problem yeah. management. Yeah. conflict yeah. resolution. Exactly. <laughs> Thinking well, I, outside the box so much. Yeah. I will, I will... To, like quickly add, I'm sorry. Like, but if you are looking, like I, I'm in that boat, like when you're looking, and you're networking with somebody, you always want to end the call. Is there somebody that you know that I should know too? Because mm -hmm. even if that person can't help you, yeah. well, that's going to trigger something. That's yeah. some, that's very smart. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. wanted to share uh, something really quick. Uh, when I was, I mentioned that I was in a factor, manufacturing company. So at some point, because my balance time, my balance of, of time was like non-existent and I was working like, 
18 hours a day. I decided that I wanted like uh, come back to to you know like uh, to to more like a, an AI, which was my, my, more my career path was web uh, services uh, company. So I just found out like or I just thought that it will be very easy that I will start applying to companies and they will just like want me there, which was not the case and. It was, it took me by surprise because I was like, dude, I'm, I'm a manager here and I was a project manager. So I have so many skills that they want. Why they don't want me? But what happened is like the best thing because rejection talk, like rejection made me grow so many skills. Mm-hmm. And I came to a point where I was unstoppable in interviews. I did so many interviews that I was just unstoppable because I started like even like categorize the, the kind of interviews that I was having. I was even able to see when I an interviewer it was like new interviewing a person and and I tried to help him right like <laughs> say like like oh uh, and do you want to know my <laughs> you know kind of thing? So <laughs> actually became of a part of me being very nervous and dealing with rejection, crying in my room and saying, why they w- wouldn't they want me to actually choose where having yeah. offers in yeah. my team and saying, I'm going to take this one. So that's that's hard work, that's discipline, that's experience. And, and that's you putting yourself out there and doing it. There's no yeah. other way. Nobody can give you that experience, but you putting yourself out there and the more you do interviews, the less you feel nervous about it. Mm-hmm. About it. Actually, you can, as, as I mentioned, you can say, like, this was a good interview. Mm-hmm. I, like, I did perfectly. You know, you, you come to this point. Rejection is the best thing that can happen yes. sometimes. Because it makes you just, like, think about yourself. Think about where you have to grow. Go there and start working on it and just do better next time. Mm-hmm. And, and rejection is redirection as well. So if you're yeah, exactly. in one yeah, place, exactly. you can go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you all for sharing such great insights in response to today's questions. I feel like there's um, we've answered most of the audience's questions today, so I think we're good. Um, and then before we go, let me just briefly remind you that whether you identify as women or not, everybody can help to make the professional world a more inclusive place. Yes. So... While the tech industry has made some progress in recent years, women continue to be badly underrepresented. And as part of that, we think that having scholarships for women is really important to get more more women into tech. So we're offering some scholarships this month. We've got the Women in Tech Scholarship, which is worth up to 19% off of our programs, our career changing programs. Um, And this year, we're also doing something new, which is offering a solidarity scholarship. And this is a large discount on our programs that is available to anyone regardless of gender, because we know that attaining true equity and inclusion requires allies from all backgrounds. And a portion of the proceeds from this solidarity scholarship will go towards our new equity scholarship fund, uh, which will provide full rides, full tuition scholarships to uh, five women in the global south in March. So to claim one of those scholarships, just book a call with one of our program advisors. And to do that, you can click on the sticky note at the top here, um, or I guess here for you. And, uh, or once we close this, you will be redirected to that page. So you'll, you'll see it there. And thank you again all for coming. Thank you to all of our panelists, Elizabeth, Marielle, Maureen, you've been amazing. <laughs> so much love in the chat as well. I think everyone thank has felt very much. your stories have resonated. Thank you. It's been Thanks very for fun. having us. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being role models. Bye, everyone. Okay. Talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.